Welcome to theCUBE, I'm Dave Vellante. Today we're going to explore the ebb and flow of data as it travels into the cloud and the data lake. The concept of data lakes was alluring when it was first coined last decade by CTO James Dixon. Rather than be limited to highly structured and curated data that lives in a relational database in the form of an expensive and rigid data warehouse or a data mart, a data lake is formed by flowing data from a variety of sources into a scalable repository, like say an S3 bucket that anyone can access, dive into, they can extract water, AKA data from that lake and analyze data that's much more fine grained and less expensive to store at scale. Now, the problem became that organizations started to dump everything into their data lakes with no schema on a right, no metadata, no context, just shove it into the data lake and figure out what's valuable at some point down the road. Kind of reminds you of your attic, right? Except this is an attic in the cloud, so it's too big to clean out over a weekend. Well, look, it's 2021, and we should be solving this problem by now. A lot of folks are working on this, but often the solutions add other complexities for technology pros. So to understand this better, we're gonna enlist the help of Chaos Search, CEO Ed Walsh, and Thomas Hazel, the CTO and founder of Chaos Search. We're also gonna speak with Kevin Miller, who's the Vice President and General Manager of S3 at Amazon Web Services. And of course, they manage the largest and deepest data lakes on the planet. And we'll hear from a customer to get their perspective on this problem and how to go about solving it. But let's get started. Ed, Thomas, great to see you. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Likewise. Face Always to face, it's really good to be it here. It is nice face to face. <laughs> That's great. So Ed, let me start with you. We've been talking about data lakes in the cloud forever. Why? is it still so difficult to extract value from those data lakes? Good question. I mean, uh, data analytics at scale has always been a challenge, right? So, and it's, uh, we're making some incremental changes. As you mentioned, we need to see some step function changes. But uh, in fact, it's the reason uh, Chaos Search was really founded. But uh, if you look at it, the same challenge around data warehouse or a data lake, really it's not just a flowing the data in, it's how to get insights out. So it kind of falls in a couple areas, but the business side will always complain. And it's kind of uniform across everything in data lakes, everything in data warehousing. They'll say, hey, listen, I typically have to deal with a centralized team to do that data prep because it's data scientists and DBAs. Most of the time they're a centralized group. Sometimes they're in business units, but most of the time because they're scarce resources together. And then it takes a lot of time. It's arduous, it's complicated. It's a rigid process I have to deal with a team. Hard to add new data. But also it's hard to, you know, it's very hard to share data and there's no way to govern it without locking it down. And of course they want to be more self-service. So there's, you hear from the business side constantly. Now underneath is like, there's some real technology issues that we haven't really changed the way we're doing data prep since the 2000s, right? So if you look at it, it, it falls at two big areas. It's one, how to do data prep. How do you take a request comes in from a business unit? I want to do X, Y, Z with this data. I want to use this type of tool sets to do the following. Someone has to be smart how to put that data in the right schema. You mentioned you have to put it in the right format that the tool sets can analyze that data before you do anything. And then second thing, I'll come back to that because that's the biggest challenge. But the second challenge is how these different data lakes and data we're are persisting data and the complexity of managing that data and also the cost of computing. And I'll go through that. But basically the biggest thing is actually getting it from raw data. So the, the, the rigidness and complexity that the business sides are using it is literally someone has to do this ETL process, extract, transform, load. They're actually taking data, a request comes in, I need so much data in this type of way to put together. They're literally physically duplicating data and putting it together in a schema they're stitching together almost a data puddle for all these different requests. And what happens is anytime they have to do that, someone has to do it and it's very skilled resources that are scant in the enterprise, right? So it's a DBA, it's a data scientist. And then when they want new data, you give them a set of data set. They're always saying, well, can I add this data? Now that I've seen the reports, I want to add this data more fresh and the same process has to happen. This takes about 60 to 80% of the data scientists and DBAs to do this work. It's kind of well documented. Uh, and this is what actually stops the process halt. That's what is rigid. They have to be rigid because there's a process around that. Uh, that's the biggest challenge of doing this. And it takes an enterprise uh, weeks or months, I always say three weeks or three months and no one you know, challenges me on that. It also takes the same skill set of people that you want to drive digital transformation, data warehousing initiatives, uh, modernization, being data driven, or all these data scientists and DBAs that you don't have enough of. So this is not only hurting you getting insights out of your data like in data warehouse, it's also this resource constraints hurting you actually getting. So that's, that smallest atomic unit is that team, that super specialized team, right? right. Yeah, okay. So do you guys talk about activating the data lake yep, sure. for analytics? What's unique about that? What problems are you all solving? Sure. 
you know, when you guys cr- created this 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 magic sauce? No, and it, basically, there's a lot of things. I, I highlighted the biggest one is how to do the data prep, but also how you're persisting and using the data. But in the end, it's like there's a lot of challenges at how to get analytics at scale. And this is really where Thomas uh, founded the team to go after this. But um, I'll try to say it simply. What we do, and I'll try to compare and contrast what we do compared to what you do with maybe an Elastic cluster or a BI cluster. Um, and if you look at it, what we do is we simply put your data in S3. Don't move it, don't transform it. In fact, we're not, we're against data movement. What we do is we literally point us at that data and we index that data and make it available in a data representation that you can give virtual views to end users. And those virtual views are available immediately over petabytes of data and it re- it actually gets presented to the end user as an open API. So if you're a Elasticsearch user, you can use all your Elasticsearch tools on this view. If you're a SQL user, Tableau, Looker, all the different tools, same thing with machine learning next year. So what we do is we take it and make it very simple. Simply put it there, it's already there already. Point us at it, we do the hard work of indexing and making it available and then you publish in their open APIs. Your users can use exactly what they do today. So that's dramatically, I'll give you a before and after. So let's say you're doing Elasticsearch, you're doing log analytics at scale. They're landing their data in S3, and then they're ETLing. They're physically duplicating and moving data and typically deleting a lot of data to get in a format that Elasticsearch can use. They're persisting it up in a data layer called Lucene. It's physically sitting on memories, CPU, uh, uh, SSDs, and it's not one of them, it's a bunch of those. They, in the cloud, you have to set them up because they're persisting, actually they stand up 7x24. Not a very cost-effective way to do the cloud, uh, cloud computing. What we do in comparison to that is literally Point us at the same S3. In fact, you can run a complete parallel. The data in S3 is being ETL'd out or just one more use case, read only, or allow you to get that data and make this virtual views. So we run a complete parallel, but what happens is we just give a virtual view to the end users. We don't need this persistence layer, this extra cost layer, this extra um, uh, time, cost, and complexity of doing that. So what happens is when you look at what happens in Elastic, they have a constraint, a trade-off of how much you can keep and how much you can afford to keep, and also it becomes unstable at time because you have to build out a schema. It's on a server, the more the schema scales out, guess what, you have to add more servers, very expensive, they're up 7 by 24, and also they become brittle. You lose one node, the whole thing has to be put together. We have none of that cost of complexity. We literally go from to keep whatever you want, whatever you want to keep on S3, a single persistence, very cost effective. And what we're able to do is um, cost, we save 50 to 80%. Why? We don't go with the old paradigm of sit it up on servers, spin them up for persistence, and keep them up 7 by 24. We're literally asking our cluster, what do you want to keep? We bring up the right compute resources and then we release those sources after the query done. So we can do some queries that they can't imagine at scale, but we're able to do the exact same query at 50 to 80% savings, and they don't have to do any of the toil of moving that data or managing that layer of persistence, which is not only expensive, it becomes brittle. And then it becomes, and I'll be quick, once you go to BI, it's the same challenge, but the BI systems, the requests are constantly coming at from a business unit down to the centralized data team, give me this flavor of data. I want to use this piece of, you know, this analytic tool in that data set. So they have to do all this pipeline. They're constantly saying, okay, I'll give you this data, this data. I'm duplicating that data. I'm moving it and stitching it together. And then the minute you want more data, they do the same process all over. We completely eliminate that. And those requests queue up. Thomas, Ed had me, you don't have to move the data. That's, that's kind of the exciting piece here, isn't it? Uh, absolutely, no, I, I think, you know, the data lake philosophy has always been solid, right? The problem is we had that Hadoop hangover, right? Mm-hmm. Where, let's say, we were using that platform a little too many variety of ways. And so, uh, I always believed in data lake philosophy. When James came and coined that, I'm like, that's it. However, HCFS, that wasn't really a service. Mm-hmm. Cloud object storage is a service. The, t- the, the elasticity, the uh, security, the durability, all that benefits uh, are really why we founded uh, on Cloud of Storage as a first move. So Ed was talking, Thomas, about you know being able to shut off essentially the compute and you have to keep paying for it. But there's other vendors out there, and, and Snowflake does something similar, separating compute from storage. That they're famous for that, and 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 you have Databricks out there doing their lake house thing. Do you compete with those? How do you participate, and how do you differentiate? Well, you know, you've heard this term, data lakes, warehouse, now lake house, and so. What everybody wants is simple in, easy in. However, the problem with data lakes was complexity of out, driving value. And I said, what if, what if you could have the easy in and the value out? So if you look at, uh, say, Snowflake as a, as a warehousing solution, you have to do all that prep and data movement to get into that system. And then it's rigid, it's static. Now, 
Databricks, now that lake house, has the exact same thing. Now, sure, they have a data lake philosophy, but their data ingestion is not a data lake philosophy. So I said, what if we had that simple in with a unique architecture and index technology, make it virtually accessible, publishable, dynamically at petabyte scale. And so our service connects to the customer's cloud storage. They just stream the data in, set up what we call a live indexing stream, and then go to our data refinery and publish views that can be consumed in Elastic API, use Kibana, Grafana, or say SQL tables, Looker, or say Tableau. And so we're getting the benefits of both sides. You know, schema on read, write performance with schema on write, read performance. And if you do that, that's the true promise of a data lake. You know, again, nothing against Hadoop, but uh, schema on read with all that complexity of uh, software was, uh, what was a little data swampy? Well, Hadoop got us started, okay, yeah. so we got to give the good props, but everybody I talked to has got this big bunch of Spark clusters now saying, all right, this, this doesn't scale. We're stuck. And so, you know, I'm a big fan of Jamak Dagani and, and her concept of the data lake, and it's, it's early days, but if you fast forward to the end of the decade, you know, what do you see as being the sort of critical components of this notion of, you know, people call it data mesh, but you got the analytic stack, uh, you, you, you're a visionary, Thomas. How do you see this thing playing out over the next decade? I love her thought leadership. To be honest, our core principles were her core principles now, you know, five, six, seven years ago. And so this idea of, you know, decentralized you know, data as a product, you know, self-serve and, and federated computer uh, governance. I mean, all that was our core principle. The trick is, how do you enable that mesh philosophy? We, I could say we're mesh ready, meaning that, you know, we can participate in a way that, very few products can participate. If there's gates, data into your system, the CTLing, the schema management, my argument with the data mesh is like producers and consumers have the same rights. I want the consumer to be able to choose how they want to consume the data as well as the producer publishing it. I can say our data refinery is that answer. You know, shoot, I love to open up a standard, right, where we can really talk about the producers and consumers and the rights each other's have. But I think she's right on in the philosophy. I think as products mature in this cloud and this data lake capabilities, the trick is those gates. If you have the structure up front, if you accept those pipelines, you know, the chance of you getting your data into a mesh is the weeks and months that uh, Ed was mentioning. Well, I think you're right. I, mean, th I think the problem with, with data mesh today is the lack of standards. You got, you know, when you draw the conceptual diagrams, you got a lot of lollipops, which are APIs, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but they're all, you yeah. know, unique primitives. That's okay, right. So there aren't standards by which, to your point, the consumer can take the data the way he or she wants it and build their own data products without having to tap people on the shoulder and say, how can I yeah. use this? Where does the data live? And and, and 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 being able to add their own data. That's you, You're exactly right. So I'm an organization. I'm generating data. Wouldn't it be great just to stream it to a lake? And then the service, a chaos search service, is the data is uh, discoverable and configurable by the consumer. Let's say you want to go to the grocery store. You know, I want to make a certain meal tonight. I want to pick and choose what I want, how I want it. Imagine if the data mesh truly can have that producer of information, you know, all the things you can buy at a grocery store, and what you want to make for dinner. And if it's static, if you have to call up your producer to do the change, was it really a data mesh enabled service? I would argue not. Mm -hmm. Ed, bring us home. Well, uh, and um, maybe one more thing with yeah, this. please, yeah. Because some of this is, we talk in 2031, but largely these principles are what we have in production today, right? So even the self-service where you can actually have business context on top of a data lake, we do that today. We talked about, we get rid of the physical ETL, which is 80% of the work, but the last 20% is done by this refinery where you can do virtual views, the right R back, and do all the transformation you need and make it available. But also that's available to, you can actually give that as a role-based access service to your end users, ask your analysts. And it, you don't have to be a data scientist or DBA. In the hands of a data scientist or DBA, it's powerful, but the fact of the matter, you don't have to. In fact, all of our employees, regardless of seniority, if they're in finance or in sales, they actually go through and learn how to do this, so you don't have to be it. So part of that, and they can come up with their own view, which that's one of the things about Data Lakes, the business unit wants to do themselves, but more importantly, because they have that context of what they're trying to do. Instead of queuing up a very specific request that takes weeks, they're able to do it themselves. And if I have to put it in different data stores and ETL, that I can do things in real time or near real time, yeah. and that's, that's game changing. And something we haven't been able to do um, ever. Yeah. And then maybe to wrap it up, listen, um, you know, eight years ago, Thomas and a group of founders came up with the concept, how do you actually get after analytics at scale and solve the real problems? And it's not one thing, it's not just getting S3, it's all these different things. And what we have in market today is the ability to literally just simply stream it to S3. By the way, 
simple to do. What we do is automate the process of getting the data in a representation that you can now share and augment. And we publish open APIs so that you can actually use the tools you want. First use case log analytics. Hey, it's easy to just stream your logs in and we give you Elasticsearch type of services. Same thing now with SQL. You'll see machine learning next year. So listen, I think we have the data lake you know, 3.0 now and uh, we're just stretching our legs. We're having a lot of fun. Well, and you actually say log analytics, but if I really do believe in this concept of building data products and data services because I want to sell them. I want to monetize them and being able to to do that quickly and easily so that I can consume them is the future. So guys, thanks so much for coming on the program. Really appreciate it. All right. In a moment, Kevin Miller of Amazon Web Services joins me. You're watching theCUBE, your leader in high-tech coverage. This is Thomas Hazel, founder CTO here at Chaos Search. I'm going to demonstrate a new feature we are offering this quarter called JSON Flex. If you're familiar with JSON data sets, there are wonderful ways to represent information. You know, they're multidimensional, they have ability to set up arrays as attributes, but those arrays are really problematic when you need to expand them or flatten them to do any type of elastic search or relational access, particularly when you're trying to do aggregations. And so the common process is to exclude those arrays or pick and choose that information. But with this new Chaos Flex capability, our system uniquely can index that data horizontally in a very small and efficient representation. And then with our Chaos Refinery, expand each attribute as you wish vertically so you can do all the basic and natural constructs you would have done if you had a straightforward two-dimensional, three-dimensional type representation. So without further ado, I'm going to get into this presentation of JSON Flex. Now, in this case, I've already set up the service to point to a particular S3 account that has CloudTrail data, one that is pretty problematic when it comes down to uh, flattening data. And again, if you know CloudTrail, one row can become 10,000 as uh, data gets flattened. So when you first log into the KS Search service, you'll see a tab called Storage. This is the S3 account, and I have a variety of buckets. I have a refinery, it's a data refinery. It's this is where we create views or lenses into these index streams that you can do analysis that publishes it in Elastic API as an index pattern or relational table in SQL. A particular bucket I have here is a whole bunch of demonstration data sets that we have to show off our, our capabilities and our offering. In this bucket, I have CloudTrail data, and I'm gonna create what we call a object group. An object group is a entry point, a filter of which files I want to index that data. Now, it could be statically there or a live stream in. These object groups have the ability to say, what type of data do you want to index on? Now, through our wizard, you can type in, you know, prefix, in this case, I wanna type in CloudTrail, and you see here, I have a whole bunch of cloud. I'm going to choose one file to make it quick and easy. But this particular cloud trail data will expand and we can show the capability of this horizontal to vertical expansion. So I walk through the wizard. As you can see here, we discover JSON. It's a gzip file. Leave flattening unlimited because we want to be able to expand infinitely. But in this case, instead of doing default virtual, I'm going to horizontally represent this information. And this uniquely compresses the data in a way that can be stored efficiently on disk, but then expanded in our data refinery on pond query or search requests. So I'm going to create this object group. Now I'm going to call this, you know, JSON flex test. And I could set up live indexing SQS, pub sub, but I'm going to skip that and skip retention and just create it. Once this object group is created, you kind of get to think of it as a virtual bucket because it does filter the data as you can see here when I look at the view. I just see CloudTrail. But within the console, I can say start indexing. Now this is static data there. It could be a live stream. And we set up workers to index this data, whether it's one file, a million files, or one terabyte or one petabyte we index the data. We discover all the schema. And as you can see here, we've discovered 104 columns. Now, what's interesting is that we represent this expansion in a horizontal way. You know, if you know CloudTrail, record zero, record one, record two, this can expand pretty dramatically if you fully flatten it. But in this case, we horizontally represent it as the index. So when I go into the data refinery, 
I can create a view. Now, if you know the data refinery of Chaos Search, you can bring multiple data streams together. You can do transformations virtually. You can do correlations. But in this case, I'm just going to take this one particular index stream we call JSON Flex and walk through our wizard. We try to simplify everything and select a particular attribute to expand. Now, again, we represent this in one row. But if you had arrays and do all the permutations, it could go one to 100 to 10,000. We had one JSON object that went from one row to one million rows. Now, clearly, you don't want to create all those permutations when you're trying to put it into a database. With our unique index technology, you can do it uh, virtually and store it horizontally. So let me just select virtual and walk through the wizard. Now, as I mentioned, we do all these different transformations, change schema. We're going to skip all that and select the order time records event and say create this. I'm going to say, you know, JSON flex view. I can set up caching. I can do a variety of things. I'm going to skip that. And once I create this, it's now available in the Elastic API as an index pattern as well as SQL via our Presto API dialect. And you can use Looker, Tableau, etc. But in this case, we go to this analytics tab and we built in the Kibana open search tooling that is Apache 2.0. And I click on discovery here and I'm going to select that particular view. Again, looks like, oops, looks like an index pattern. And I'm going to choose, let's see here, let's choose 15 years from, from past and present to make sure I find where, where it actually was timed. And what you'll see here is, you know, sure, it's just one particular data set has a variety of columns. What you see here is unlike that record zero, records one, now it's expanded. And so it has been expanded like a vertical flattening that you would traditionally do if you wanted to do anything that was an elastic or a relational construct, you know, to fit into a table format. Now, the advantage of JSON Flex, you don't have to store it as a blob and use these proprietary JSON APIs. You can use your native Elastic API or your native SQL tooling to get access naturally without that expense of that explosion or without the complexity of ETLing it and picking and choosing um, before you actually put it into the database. That completes the demonstration of Chaos Search's new JSON Flex capability. If you're interested, come to chaosearch.io and set up a free trial. Thank you. Welcome back. I really like the drill down on data lakes with Ed Walsh and Thomas Hazel. They're building some cool stuff over there. In the data lake we see it's evolving and Chaos Search has built some pretty cool tech to enable customers to get more value out of data that's in lakes so that it doesn't become stagnant. Time to dig, dig deeper, dive deeper into the water. We're here with Kevin Miller, who's the Vice President and General Manager of S3 at Amazon Web Services. We're going to talk about activating S3 for analytics. Kevin, welcome. Good to see you again. Yeah, thanks, Dave. It's great to be here again. So S3 was the very first service offered by AWS 15 years ago. We covered that out in Seattle. It was a great event you guys had. It has become the most prominent and popular example of object storage in the marketplace. And for years, customers use S3 as simple, cheap data storage. But because there's so much data now stored in S3, customers are looking to do more with the platform. So Kevin, as we look ahead to reInvent this year, we're super excited about that. What's new? What's got you excited when it comes to the AWS flagship storage offering? Yeah, Dave, well, that's right. And, and we're definitely looking forward to reInvent. We have some fun things that we're planning to announce there. So. Stay tuned on those, but I'd say that one of the things that's most exciting for me as customers do more with their data and look to, to store more, to capture more of the data that they're generating every day is our storage class that we had announced a few years ago, but we, we actually just announced some improvements to the S3 Intelligent Tiering Storage class. And this is really our storage class, the only one in the cloud at this point that delivers automatic storage cost savings for customers where the data access patterns change. And that can happen, for example, as customers have some data that they're collecting and then a team 
spins up and decides to try and to do something more with that data. And that data that was very cool and sitting sort of idle is now being actively used. And so with intelligent tiering, we're automatically monitoring data. And then there's for customers, there's no retrieval costs and no tiering charges. And we're automatically moving the, the data into a, an access tier that reduces their cost though when that data is not being accessed. So we've announced some improvements to that just a few months ago. And I'll just say, look forward to some more announcements at reInvent that will extend, continue to extend what we have in our intelligent tiering storage class. And that's cool, Kevin. I mean, you've seen, you know, that technology, that tiering concept has been around, you know, been since back in the mainframe days. The problem was it was always inside a box. So you, you didn't have the scale of the cloud and you didn't have that automation. So I, I want right. to ask you, as the leader of S, S3, that business. When you meet with customers, Kevin, what do they tell you that they're, they're, they're facing as challenges when they want to do more, get better insights out of all that data that they've moved into S3? Well, I think that's just it, Dave. I think that most customers I speak with, they, of course, they have the, the things that they want to do with their storage costs, you know, reducing storage costs and just, and, and making sure they have capacity available. But increasingly, I think the real emphasis is around business transformation. What can I do with this data that's very unique and different that either, that unlike you know, prior optimizations where it would just reduce the bottom line, they're saying, what can I do that will actually drive my top line more by either you know, generating new product ideas, um, allowing for faster you know, close, closed loop process for acquiring customers. And so it's really that business transformation and the, all, everything around it that I think is really exciting. And, and for a lot of customers, that's a pretty long journey and, and helping them get started on that, including you know, transforming their workforce and upskilling you know, parts of their workforce to be more agile and more oriented around software development, developing new products using software. So when I first met the folks at, at Chaos Search, you know, Thomas took me through sort of the architecture with, with Ed as well. They had me at, you don't have to move your data. That was the, that was the grabber for me. And there are a number of public customers, Digital River, uh, Blackboard, Klarna, we're going to get the customer perspective a little later on and others, that use both AWS S3 and Chaos Search and they're trying to get more out of their, their S3 data and execute analytics at scale. So, I wonder if you could share with us, Kevin, what types of activities and, and opportunities do you see for customers like these that are making the move to put their enterprise data in S3 in terms of capabilities and outcomes that they are trying to achieve and are able to achieve beyond using S3 as just a bit bucket? Right. Well, Dave, I think you hit the nail on the head when you talk about outcomes, because that I think is, is key here. Customers want to reduce the time it takes to get to a tangible result that, that affects the business, that improves their business. And so that's one of the things that I excites me about what Chaos Search is doing here specifically is that automatic indexing, being able to, to take the data as it is in their bucket, index it and keep that index fresh and then allow for the customers to innovate on top of that and to try to experiment with you know, a new capability, see, see what works, and then double down on the things that really do work to, to drive that business. And so I just think that that capability reduces the amount of what I might call undifferentiated heavy lifting, the, the work to just sort of index and you know, organize and catalog data, and instead allow customers to really focus on, here's the idea Let's try to get this into production or into a test environment as quickly as possible to see if this can really drive some value for our business. Yeah, so you're seeing that sort of value that you mentioned, the non-differentiated heavy lifting, moving up the stack, right? It used to just be provisioning right. and managing the storage. Now it's all the layers above that and, and, and we're going beyond that. So my question to you, Kevin, is how do you see the evolution of this, all this data at scale. I'm especially interested as it pertains to data that's of course in S3, which is your swim lane. When you sure. talk to customers, who want to do more with their data and analytics. And by the way, even beyond analytics, you know, we're having conversations now in the community about, about building data products and, and creating new value, but how do you respond and how do you see Chaos Search fitting in to those outcomes? Well, I think that's, that's it, Dave. It's about kind of going up the stack and instead of spending time organizing and cataloging data, particularly as the data volumes get much larger. When you know, modern customers and modern data lakes that we're seeing quickly go from a few petabytes to tens to hundreds of petabytes or more. And when you're reaching that kind of scale of data, 
it, it's a single person can't reasonably kind of wrap their head around all that data. You need tools. Uh, S3 provides a number of first party tools and, you know, we're investing in things like our S3 batch operations to really help give the end users of that data, the business owners, that uh, leverage to manage their data at scale and, and, and apply their, their new ideas to the data and, and, and generate you know, uh, pilots and, and production work that really drives their business forward. And so I think that you know, Chaos Search, again, I would just say is a good example of you know, the kind of software that I think helps go upstack, automate some of that data management, and just help customers focus really specifically on the things that they want to accomplish for their their business. So this is really important. I mean, we've talked for you know well over a decade how to get more value out of, out of data, and it's been challenging for a lot of organizations. But we're seeing we're seeing themes of scale, automation, fine grain tooling, ecosystem participating uh, on top of that data, and then extracting right. that that data value. So Kevin, I'm really excited to see you face to face. <laughs> at reInvent and, and learn more about some of the announcements that you're going to make. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see you there. Yeah, stay tuned. Looking forward to seeing you in person. Absolutely. All right, great to have, have Kevin on. Keep it right there because in a moment, we're going to get the customer perspective on how a leading practitioner is applying chaos search on top of S3 to create a business value from data. You're watching theCUBE, your leader in digital high-tech coverage. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Jimmy McDermott. Excited to be talking about log analytics and uh, how much chaos search uh, has helped us scale our data lake. Uh, so just by way of, of background for Transio, our overarching mission is to eliminate the pencil and paper gaps in educational systems. And what what that looks like in reality uh, is storing a lot of data for school districts because everything that's on paper right now can be converted to some kind of electronic digital process. Now, we're part of a, a new ed tech product category that's been emerging over the last few years called readiness solutions. We pull together all of these disparate data points that schools are housing on students and show it to students in a really consumable and digestible way for them to understand how close am I to graduation? What am I falling off track by picking a particular uh, class or, or what have you. And so by doing that, you can just kind of start to grasp the sheer amount of data that we're pulling in per student, per district across the country at scale um, and, and why logging started to become really, really critical for us. When it comes to just the logs themselves is actually pretty simple, um, but the, the infrastructure and the requirements around it are not simple. We have one big monolithic service, but we've got many different types of logging outputs. So things that are coming from our database driver, things that are coming directly from our application layer, our networking layer. Um, and, and all of those are coming into currently kind of a central repository. We offer retention for data and for logs up to our longest customer's requirement. Um, so our longest customer's data requirement right now is holding on to data seven years post-graduation. Before Chaos Search, we had kind of this mismanaged way of, of bringing all these different items together. It was truly a mess. Like we were um, really kind of at our wits end looking for a solution that was going to actually bring all this stuff together. Um, we did consider spinning up a self-managed ELK stack. It, it really struggles at scale with that retention and that historical data. It's, it's fine for spinning something up um, to analyze you know, really hot data that's hot for like a day. Um, and then it needs to, to get flushed out of that system so that it can stay hot and um, stay cost effective because standing up those stacks yourself is, is something that was just going to break the bank for us. So um, we, were, we were truly lost um, looking for, for the right solution. And then... Uh, perhaps most importantly, in, in a sense, it, it, it couldn't break the bank. Chaos Search met all of those needs and, and then more. We stream our logs directly from our Kubernetes uh, infrastructure right into our S3 buckets, uh, which is amazing, by the way, because um, when we were setting up our new DevOps environment, we had engineers uh, basically saying, like, why would we do that? Like, why not just ship it 
uh, to this? Like, why why go to the extra effort of setting up a Fluent D connector to move things into S3? And um, and they're all sold now. <laughs> it didn't take long for them to, to really see the value of why we were doing that. Um, and then the cool thing is that we don't really have to worry about those retention policies being managed by us anymore because S3 has all of that built in. Our developers can actually iterate faster now because they're able to access real life production logs around certain features and around certain capabilities that they previously couldn't. And so they can actually make decisions about new architecture components or refactoring that are backed up by data. Um, and that's really at the core of everything we're doing. Um, on a super tangible level, we actually, some recent uh, technical diligence that we had went way faster because we own our logs. Uh, usually that's not something that ed tech companies are, are really thinking about. And so making this move uh, actually led to a faster turnaround time for us on that tech diligence, which was really exciting. For the cost savings that you get for a solution like Chaos Search, and then the fact that you layer on those enterprise type of features like RBAC and SSO and these other um, things that are part of the platform that with a different company you would pay ridiculous amounts of money for, um, that's incredibly appealing for a company that is dealing with intense data security and data governance requirements, but also not a super big company, right? We can't afford enterprise contracts. So um, this is this is exactly right. And it's, it's exactly one of the reasons that we were so drawn to Chaos Search. Okay, we're back with Mark Hill, who's the director of IT operations at Digital River. Mark, welcome to theCUBE, good to see you. Oh, thanks for having me, I really appreciate it. Hey, tell us a little bit more about Digital River. People know you as a, a, a payment platform, you've got marketing expertise. Yeah. How, how do you differentiate from other e-commerce e platforms? Well, uh, I don't think people realize it, but Digital River was founded about 27 years ago, um, primarily as a one-stop shop for e-commerce, right? And, and so we offered site development, hosting, order management, fraud, uh, expert controls, tax, um, physical and digital fulfillment, um, as well as multilingual customer service, um, advanced reporting, and email marketing campaigns, right? So it was really just kind of a, a broad base for e-commerce. People could just go there, didn't have to worry about anything. Um, what we found over time as e-commerce has matured, um, we've really pivoted to a more focused uh, API offering, um, specializing in just our global seller services. And to us, that means payment, fraud, tax, and um, compliance management. So our, our global footprint um, allows companies to outsource that risk management and expand their markets internationally um, very quickly and, and uh, with low um, cost of entry. Yeah, it's an awesome business. And, and you know, to your point, you, you were founded way before there was such a thing as the modern cloud, and yet you're a cloud native business. Um, yeah. Which you know, I think talks to the fact that, that incumbents can evolve, they can reinvent themselves from a technology perspective. I wonder if you could first paint a picture of, of how you use the cloud. You, you use AWS, you know, I'm sure you got S3 mm -hmm. in there. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so when I think of a cloud native business, you kind of go back to the history. Well, 27 years ago, there wasn't a cloud, right? There wasn't any public infrastructure. It was, uh, we basically stood our own data center up in a warehouse. Um, and, and so over our history, we've managed our own infrastructure and co-located uh, data centers. Uh, over time through acquisitions and uh, just how things worked, uh, you know, there was over 10 data centers globally. Um, for us, it was expensive, both from a software hardware perspective, as well as you know getting the operational teams and expertise up to up to speed too. So, um, and it was really difficult to maintain, and ultimately not core to our business. Right? Nowhere in our mission statement does it say that we're uh, our goal is to manage data centers. <laughs> So, so about five years ago, we started the journey um, from our hosted into AWS. Um, it was a 100% lift and shift plan. Um, and we were able to complete that migration a little over uh, two years, right? Um, Amazon really just fit for us. Uh, it was a natural, um, a natural place for us to land and, and they made it really easy here for us too. Um, not to say it wasn't difficult, but um, but once in the public cloud, we really adopted a cloud first vision, um, meaning that will not only consume their infrastructure as a service, 
um, but will also purposely evaluate and migrate to software as a service. So I come from a database background. So an example would be migrating from self-deployed and managed relational databases over to AWS uh, RDS, relational database service. Um, you know, you're able to utilize the backups, the standby and the patching tools um, automatically, you know, with a click of the button. And that's pretty cool. Um, and, and so we moved away from the time consuming operational tasks and, and really put our resources into revenue generating products, mm -hmm. you know, like pivoting to an API offering. Um, I always like to say that we stop being busy and start being productive. <laughs> I love that. So that's really what, <laughs> what the cloud has done for us. Is that what you mean by cloud native? I mean, being able to take advantage of those primitives and native APIs, what, what does that mean for your business? Yeah, exactly. I, I think, well, the, the first step for us was just to consume the infrastructure, right? Um, and the, but now we're looking at targeted uh, services that they have in there too. So, uh, you know, um, we have our, our, our data stream of services. So log analytics, for example, we used to put it locally on the machine. Now we're just dumping it into an S3 bucket and we're using um, a Kinesis to consume that data, put it in Elastic and uh, go from there. And, and none of the services are, are managed by DigiRiver. We're just utilizing the capabilities that AWS has there too, so. It, um, and as an e-commerce player, retail company, do you, were you ever concerned about moving to AWS as a possible competitor or did you look at other clouds? What well, can you tell us about that? Yeah, and, and so I, I think um, e-commerce is really mature, right? And, and so we, we got squeezed out by the Amazons of the world. Um, it's just not something that we were doing, but we had really a, a good um, area of expertise with our global seller services. But so we evaluated Microsoft, we evaluated AWS and, as well as Google. And, you know, back when we did that, Microsoft was uh, Windows based. Uh, Google was just coming into the picture, really didn't fit for what we were doing. Um, but Amazon was just a natural fit. So we made a business decision, right? It was um, financially, uh, really the best decision for us. And so we didn't really um, put our feelings into it, right? Um, we just had to move forward and it's better than where we're at. And, and we've been delighted actually. Yeah, makes sense. Best cloud, best best tech. Um, yeah. You know, I want to talk about chaos search. A lot of people describe it as a data lake for log analytics. Do you agree mm -hmm. with that? You know, what, what, is that, what does that even mean? Yeah, well, um, from, from our perspective, because our self-managed solutions were costly uh, and difficult to maintain, uh, you know, we had older versions of self-deployed um, using Splunk, other things like that too. So um, over time, uh, we made a conscious decision to limit our data retention, you know, generally seven days. But in a lot of cases, it was zero. We just couldn't consume that, uh, that log data um, because of the cost um, in maintaining it. So um, because of this limit, you know, we've lost important data points um, used for incident triage, problem management, problem management, uh, trending and, and other things too. So chaos search has offered us a manageable and cost effective opportunity to store months or even years of data that we can use for operations um, as well as trending automation. And really the, the big thing that we're pushing into is an event driven architecture so that we can proactively manage our services. Yeah, you mentioned Elastic. So I know I've talked to people who use the Elk stack. They say you get this, these exponential growth in, in the amount of data. So you have to cut it off at whatever. I think you said seven days or, or less. Yeah. You're saying you're not finding that with, with chaos search? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that was one of the huge benefits here too. So, uh, you know, we were losing out if, if there was, you know, lower priority incident, for example, and people didn't get to it till eight, nine days later, well, all the breadcrumbs are gone. So um, it was really just kind of the best guess or the incident really wasn't resolved. We didn't find a real cause. Yeah, like my video camera down at my, you know, my other house, <laughs> like somebody breaks in, I, I don't find out for, for two weeks and then the, the video's gone. So it's kind of the same thing. So, yeah. so, so how do you, can you give us some more detail on how you use your data lake and chaos search uh, uh, specifically? Yeah, yeah, yep. And, and so there's there's many different areas, but what we found is we were able to um, easily consolidate data from multiple regions uh, into a single uh, pane of glass to our customers, so uh, internal and externally. Um, and it relieved us of that operational support for the, the data extract transformation load process, right? 
uh, it offered us also a seamless transition for the users who were familiar with Elasticsearch, right? It wasn't, um, wasn't difficult to move over. And so these are a lot of selling points benefits. Um, and, and so now that we have all of this data that we're able to, to capture and utilize, um, it gives us an opportunity to use um, machine learning, predictive analysis, and like I said, you know, driving to an event-driven architecture. Um, okay. So that's that's really what it's offered, and it's it's been a huge benefit. So you're saying you can speak the language of, of Elastic, you don't have to move the data out of an S3 bucket, and you can scale more easily, is that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and so for us, just because we're running in multiple regions to, to drive more high availability, um, having that data uh, available from multiple regions in a single pane of glass or a single way to utilize it uh, is a huge benefit as well. Uh, just to, you know, not to mention actually having the data. <laughs> what, was the, what was the initial catalyst to sort of rethink what, what you were doing with log analytics? Was it cost? Was it flexibility, scale? Uh, there was, um, I think all of those went into it. The, one of the main drivers, so so last year we had a huge project. So we have our elk stack and it's probably from uh, a decade ago, right? And, you know, uh, version point uh, or two or something, you know, anyways, it's, it's very old. And we went uh, through a whole project to get that upgraded and migrated over. And it was just, we found it impossible internally to do, right? And so this was a, a method for us to get out of that business, um, to get rid of the security risk, the support risk, um, and have uh, a way for people to, to easily migrate over. Um, and it was just a nightmare here, uh, consolidating the data across regions. And so that was, that was a huge thing. But yeah, it was also then the cost, right? It was, um, we're finding it uh, cheaper to use chaos search and have more data available versus what we're doing uh, currently in AWS. Got it. I wonder if you could you could share maybe any stories that you have or examples that mm -hmm. that, that underscore the impact that this approach to analytics is yeah. having in your business. Maybe your te team's everyday activities. Any any metrics you can provide, yeah. or even just anecdotal information. Yeah, yeah, and and I think uh, you know one coming from an Oracle background here. So DigiRiver historically has been an Oracle shop, right? And we've been developing and reporting an analytics environment on Oracle, and that's complicated and expensive, right? Um, we had to use advanced features uh, in Oracle like partitioning, materialized views, uh, and bring in other supporting software like Informatica, and Hyperion, SBase, right? And all of these required a large team. Um, with a wide set of expertise uh, into these separate focus areas, right? And uh, the amount of data <laughs> that we were pushing into chaos search uh, would simply have overwhelmed this legacy method for data analysis in a relational database, um, right? Um, and not to mention the human toll of, <laughs> of the stress of supporting that Oracle environment in a 24 by 7 by 365 environment you know, which requires little or no downtime. So um, just that alone uh, is a huge thing. So it's allowed us to break away from Oracle. It's allowed us to use new technologies that make sense to solve business solutions. I, you know, Chaos Search is a really interesting company to me. I'm sure, you know, like me, you see a lot of startups. I'm sure they're knocking on your door every day. And I, I always like to say, okay, where are they going after? Are they going after a big market? How are they getting product market fit? And it seems like Chaos Search has really looked at hard at, at log analytics and kind of yes. maybe disrupting the Elk stack. But I see, you know, other potential use cases, you know, beyond mm -hmm. analyzing logs. I wonder if you agree, are there other use cases that you see in, in your future? Yeah, exactly. So um, I, I think there's, um, well, one area would be uh, Splunk, for example. We we have that here too. So um, we use Splunk versus you know flat file analysis or uh, other ways to to capture that data, just because um, from a PCI perspective, it, it needs to be secured um, for our compliance and certification, right? So um, Chaos Search allows us to do that. There's different types of authentication. Um, really a hodgepodge of authentication that we used in our old environment, but uh, Chaos Search has a more um, uh, easily 
a usable one, one that we can set up, one that can uh, really segregate the data uh, and allow us to satisfy our PCI requirements too. So, um, but Splunk, but I think really, uh, you know, deprecating all of our elastic search environments, uh, our homegrown ones, um, but then also taking a hard look at what we're doing with uh, relational databases, right? Um, 27 years ago, there was only relational databases, you know, Oracle and SQL Server. So uh, we, we've been logging into uh, those types of databases um, and that's not cost effective, it's not supportable. Um, and so really getting away from that and putting the data where it belongs um, and is easily accessible in a secure environment allowing us to, to uh, push our business forward. And when you say where the data belongs, it, 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 it sounds like you're putting it in the bit bucket, S3, leaving it yeah. there is it's the most cost effective way to do it and then sort of you know adding value on top of it that's what's interesting about chaos search to me yeah exactly yep yep versus the high price storage you know that you have to use for a relational database um, you know and not to mention the the standbys the backups so you know you're duplicating triplicating all this data here too uh, in an expensive manner so yeah yeah, copy well, creep, you're it. moving data around, it gets expensive. Mm -hmm. It's funny what you say about databases, it's true. The database used to be such a boring market, now it's exploded. Then you had the whole NoSQL movement, and SQL, yeah. SQL became the killer app. You know, it's like <laughs> full circle. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, well, anyway, good stuff, Mark. Really, really appreciate you coming on theCUBE and, and sharing your perspectives. We'd love to have you back in the future. Oh yeah, yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me, I really appreciate it. Yeah, our pleasure. Okay, in a moment, I'll have some closing thoughts on getting more value out of your growing data lakes. You're watching theCUBE, your leader in high tech coverage. Innovation, impact, influence. Welcome to theCUBE. Disruptors, developers, and practitioners. Learn from the voices of leaders who share their personal insights from the hottest digital events around the globe. Enjoy the best this community has to offer on theCUBE, your global leader in high-tech digital coverage. Okay, so that's a wrap. You know, we're seeing a new era in data and analytics. For example, we're moving from a world where data lives in a cloud object store and needs to be extracted moved into a new data store, transformed, cleansed, structured into a schema, and then analyzed. This cumbersome and expensive process is being revolutionized by companies like Chaos Search that leave the data in place and then interact with it in a multilingual fashion with tooling that's familiar to analytic pros. You know, I see a lot of potential for this technology beyond just log analytics use cases, but that's a good place to start. You know, really, if I project out into the future, we see a trend of the global data mesh really taking hold, where a data warehouse or a data hub or a data lake or an S3 bucket is just a discoverable node on that mesh. And that's governed via automated computational processes. And I do see chaos search as an enabler of this vision. You know, but for now, if you're struggling to scale with existing tools or you're forced to limit your attention because data is exploding at too rapid a pace, you might want to check these guys out. You can schedule a demo just by clicking the button on the site to do that, or stop by the Chaos Search booth at AWS reInvent. The Cube is going to also be there. We'll have two sets, 100 guests. I'm Dave Vellante. You're watching the Cube, your leader in high-tech coverage. <laughs>